Well, hello everyone, it's great to be here. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we meet today, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to thank the Royal Society of Victoria for having me come and speak today. Now to begin with, for those who don't know MTP Connect, I'd like to begin by explaining a little bit about what MTP Connect does um, around medical commercialisation of products and innovation. So MTP Connect was formed in 2015 out of the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources Growth Centre Initiative. We're one of six growth centres and we're existing to promote the rate of growth of Australians' medical technologies, pharmaceutical, biotechnology and digital health sectors in Australia. Now we work with all participants across the sector, whether they be small or large companies, researchers, industry associations, governments, universities, investors and regulators to connect each other and drive the rate of growth of the sector. And we work towards four separate outcomes and they are to increase collaboration and commercialisation across the sector, improve management and workforce skills, increase access to global supply chains and international markets, as well as optimising the regulatory environment. Now we do this in three ways. The first way is deploying strategic funding into the sector through our Commonwealth programs, and I'll touch on a little bit of this um, in detail a bit later. We also act as an independent voice. We're an independent organisation, not for profit. We're a non-membership organisation and we're neither government nor industry. So we're seen as an independent voice in the sector to advise government on policies and regulations that may be barriers to growing the sector in Australia. We also take direct action through education programs and to further collaboration in the sector, and we work with our partners as well on programs to further commercialisation and collaboration. We also work with researchers and companies to ensure that they've got access to inter international markets and making connections overseas as well. Now in terms of the strategic funding which we deploy, we operate five distinct business units at MTP Connect. One is through the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources and this is a $15.6 million growth centre initiative where we've supported 36 projects. Then we also run four different programs which are through the Department of Health and the MRFF. So these are the BMTH programs, the BTB programs, the READY initiative which is uh, focused on uh, building workforce skills and capability in the sector and addressing skills gaps. And we also run the Targeted Translation Research Accelerator which is a $47 million program focusing on diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And we're working to establish two research centres for that, one in diabetes and one in cardiovascular disease. And we'll have annual rounds of funding for, to address projects in that area as well. So overall, we're deploying $160 million into the sector across these DISA and MRFF programs. And in terms of the projects that we support, uh, we've got $78 million worth of uh, support for 103 projects so far. Now each year we put out our sector competitiveness plan and this certainly uh, lays out the roadmap for our activities over the coming years um, and it does in large part by examining the emerging megatrends and knowledge priorities in health and medical research. And it aligns with areas where there's a high level of unmet need and where Australia can be a global um, leading contributor in those areas as well. So I mentioned megatrends. Um, there's nine emerging megatrends that we outline in our SCP. Um, and these are megatrends that we'll be seeing that will reshape our world in the next 10 or up to 50 years. Now I won't go through all of these today, but as you can see from the slide, digital evolution is central to the mega trends and influence all of the other ones as well. So the rapid evolution of digital technologies um, are having a substantial impact as we have increasing access to data and being able to exchange data in real time. It's certainly an enabler and a disruptor and linked with this, Cybersecurity is certainly going to be a growing challenge, demanding increased attention for the sector as well. You also see precision medicine and precision healthcare as a mega trend. 
The rise of targeted pharmaceuticals and biologics um, and personalised medical technologies is certainly a key theme. And the developments of genomics, uh, gene editing and big data and analytics um, are certainly accelerating the rise of precision medicine as well. You also see that consumers are increasingly aware of issues affecting their health and are looking to increase um, their control over their own healthcare needs as well and maintain responsibility for improving their health. Mental health and wellbeing, while they're not megatrends, they are certainly factors that are influencing the megatrends of chronic burden and consumer control as well and are certainly impacting on healthy ageing. So the SCP also outlines the knowledge priorities. As you can see from this slide, it's quite a busy slide, but the knowledge priorities are intended to provide a strategic focus for the sector's activities. So there are six current areas of science. Um, there's nine therapeutic areas, five device and diagnostics, and then there's four other existing national priorities um, as well, which we concentrate on. Now, it's also acknowledged we require um, the skills and capabilities to support success in these areas as well. So as I said, these areas um, of science, therapeutic areas and devices are areas where there's a high unmet need globally and where Australia has the potential to be a leading global contributor in these areas as well. And down the bottom, you'll see that there's emerging um, knowledge priorities as well, which are thought to be of increasing importance um, in the near future. So when we have a look at the MTP sector in Australia, you'll see that MTP sector is Australia's eighth largest export segment, which supports 68,000 skilled jobs in the sector, and there's 1,300 companies in the MTP sector as well. Manufacturing exports are now worth $8.2 billion, and $5.2 billion is added to the Australian economy through the MTP sector. Now, in 2019, uh, we know that there were more than, more than 1,800 clinical trials started in Australia, and based on the 2017 figure that we had for clinical trials, this contributed $1.1 billion to the economy. We've got 7,000 people employed in the clinical trial sector, so whether that be within companies, um, clinical research associate, associates or clinical research managers. Within the hospitals, you've got um, study coordinators and research managers involved in actually running the clinical trials at hospitals or GP clinics and what have you. So you've got all this um, infrastructure and people working on clinical trials in Australia, which then brings in, um, when we talk about a service export, we're bringing in money from overseas. So large pharma companies, um, medical device companies are running their clinical trials in Australia. So this is actually bringing in um, money into the economy from overseas. And this service export, we sort of consider that as um, the fact that you've got this whole industry um, that is contributing to um, the economy as well. Now we need to acknowledge that this data is quite outdated and at the moment we are undergoing a refresh of our 2017 clinical trials in Australia report. I'm leading that effort for MTP Connect um, and certainly of great interest for me because of my background. Um, but certainly if you've got an interest in clinical trials, we are consulting widely across the sector, so please do get in touch if you're interested in hearing more about that. It's an important sector as there's around 7,000 skilled jobs supported by the clinical trials industry in Australia. The report update that we're doing um, from the 2017 report is going to be really key for continuing um, the review of the clinical trials sector, what initiatives we need to be doing to support the sector because of the input into the um, economy and jobs as well. So we need to be ensuring that we've got the right infrastructure and programs um, and ways of working to streamline how clinical trials are run in Australia. Um, so that's a key part of, of what we concentrate on as well, because we want to be attracting more work from these large companies to Australia. Um, because of the um, employment and the sector it supports, but also because of the health benefits now, we also need to acknowledge that the MTP sector has played a leading role in the fight against COVID. 
by fast-tracking research into vaccines, medical devices and vaccines. They've also played a key role in ensuring that we're, we could secure vital medical supplies um, during the pandemic. Now, just on that, we can't um, skip over COVID-19. It's been an, an important uh, impact on the medical technology space in Australia and indeed globally, as well as other sectors. And to get a better handle on the impact of COVID-19, last year, MTP Connect did do a series of reports and investigations into the impact of COVID-19. The first report that we put out was looking at the impact of COVID-19 from the start of the pandemic through to May 2020. And we certainly saw a great impact on the sector with over 90% of clinical trials being put on hold, elective surgeries were banned, we had supply chain integrity issues, and there's certainly severe revenue losses for universities, which um, contributed to job losses and medical research impact as well. We also saw that pre-revenue companies uh, were ineligible for JobKeeper, which had a large impact as well. We then put out a second report in October 2020, which was uh, provided some more data, but started to look at the road to recovery and what needed to occur in terms of future pandemic preparedness. And then we also need to acknowledge that during that time, there was a great deal of collaboration between state and federal governments and industry to secure vital medical supplies um, within Australia as well. So we've put out a third supplementary report in association with MTAA, um, which was looking at that collaboration and the response to COVID-19 within the industry. So if we look at this slide, we'll see that this is from our first report and shows the impact of COVID-19 across the sector. We certainly saw there's a strong negative impact in those in that early period, and it did vary between whether a company was focused on basic research, whether they're involved in preclinical R&D, clinical development, manufacturing or sales and distribution. We saw that the greatest impact was on those involved in basic research and preclinical R&D compared to those who are concentrating on later phase trials or commercialisation activities. We also know that companies were more negatively impacted if they were not aligned with infectious diseases and respiratory therapy areas. And those companies that did have an alignment with the pandemic, so they were working in infectious diseases or um, respiratory, they certainly had a less of an impact on the COVID uh, pandemic. But what we saw from the second report was that despite a slow growth of manufacturing exports, shown on this slide, our report showed an appetite for innovation. Since May, the sector had strongly recovered from the pandemic slump, and we saw in the first eight months of the financial year of 2020, performance against the key metrics um, followed an upward trajectory. We can see from this slide that there was around $650 million raised by MTP sector companies in the first six months of 2020, which was an increase of 110% from the first half of 2019. And you can certainly see from this slide as well that companies continued to patent and so there's a lot of appetite for innovation um, towards the second half of the year as well. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen that Australia hasn't had, um, hasn't been impacted as, as other countries have. So why, whereas we haven't been able to be involved in the COVID-19 clinical trials because we haven't um, had the disease burden here, we've still got an opportunity for us to run clinical trials in Australia where they've been shut down um, in other countries because they're dealing with the pandemic and have had to shift their um, workforce um, to be dealing with the pandemic as well as keeping their patients and staff safe. So there's a great opportunity. We've already seen um, in the second half of last year an increased um, inquiry rate of running clinical trials in Australia. And when we talk to our CROs and pharma companies, that's what we're hearing. So we're hoping to be able to see that from the report um, that comes out uh, in a few months' time as well. So I think that's really key for us to harness that opportunity um, to get more clinical trials into Australia, but we also need to be ensuring we've got the infrastructure to support that. We already know that we've got a shortage of clinical research associates to be able to support that, and there's always, um, always needing more staff within hospitals 
um, to support that as well. So I think when you put together the opportunity for bringing more clinical trials to Australia in this current environment, um, the economic impact that that has for Australia, we need to be ensuring that we've got the infrastructure and programs and ways of working to support that, to really harness that as well. So if we take a step back, we need to remember that Australia has a really strong and rich history in innovation and commercialisation. This particular slide shows um, some of the great successes of the companies of the likes of CSL, which was listed in 1994 for about $2.30 a share and had a valuation of around $300 million, is now valued at $108 billion, and it's delivering key vaccines and protein-based therapies for bleeding disorders and a range of other disorders now. Certex Medical developed a cancer treatment that utilises radioactive microspheres to treat liver cancer. It's available in more than 40 countries around the world and it's recently been acquired by a Chinese company. And then you've got the medical technologies companies, Cochlear, which is the world's leading cochlear implant company, and ResMed, that is um, a leader in treating sleep apnea as well. And then there's the Green Whistle the uh, development by Medical Developments International, which is the Penthrox inhaler. Most common uh, medical device, I think, seen on Bondi Rescue. It's in, been improved in countries around the globe, and it was based on um, a discovery to commercialisation journey uh, supported by collaborations with the CSIRO. But then you've also got other companies that demonstrate you don't need to be big and you don't need to have products on the market to be successful. You can have success through being acquired or through um, attractive, attracting funding, and a number of these companies have done so. Inflazone, which uh, was formed in 2016 out of the University of Queensland and Trinity College in Ireland, um, was recently acquired by Roche in 2020 uh, in September. And you've also got the example of Vaxis, which has a funding agreement through BARDA in the US for $30 million. And you've got great examples on this slide, but you've also got the recent announcement of Elume that's received more than $250 million funding agreement through the US government to progress the at-home COVID-19 diagnostic kit that they're developing. So great examples of Australian innovations um, being commercialised. What we need to be doing is ensuring that we're keeping Australian innovation on shore for longer. At some stage, you're going to have to go into the big wide world and go offshore because there's larger markets um, out there. But I think the key is to be finding ways to keep that onshore longer um, so it is supporting um, the Australian sector. But I think there's a real, um, from conversations that I've had with companies, they do want to be keeping their innovations in Australia. They want to be manufacturing in Australia, but they want to be looking global, globally as well. So I think there's an appetite for keeping that onshore for longer. But certainly even for companies that do need to go offshore, for marketing and what have you, that is still supporting Australian, um, the Australian innovation system as well. And you certainly don't need to have a company as well to have impact. If you look at Professor Ian Fraser out of the TRI in Queensland with his cervical cancer vaccine, Gardasil, has been a significant contributor of note. We know that turning his science behind his interest in HBV and cervical cancer took a 15-year journey in collaboration with scientists, clinicians and industrial partners, which has resulted in Gardasil, which has been given to more than 23 million people since 2006. And it's looking like Australia is going to be the first country to be largely free of cervical cancer. So this is a great example of scientists working with industry, um, being able to work both ways um, in terms of those great collaborations um, to see uh, great commercialisation outcomes. And then closer to home, you've got these examples of Venetoclax, which was out of the Weehi um, and developed through AbbVie and uh, Genentech. In 2017, they licensed part of their royalty stream to a Canadian pension fund for $405 million. And then they've got the example of Medicines Development for Global Health, which has developed moxidentin 
for river blindness and that is now available um, right around the world and that's another great example of innovation coming out of Victoria as well. So certainly great examples of innovation in Australia being commercialised. Now all of these successes um, are underpinned by Australia's sophisticated medical research environment. Uh, we've got an excellent re research infrastructure and a world-class healthcare system to underpin that. With about 1,300 MTP companies, 130 AXS listed life science companies, about 50 independent medical research institutes and more than 40 universities focusing on clinical research. We've also got five um, of our universities in the top 50 as well. We've also got 50 clinical trials networks to support this, more than 50, uh, 50 biobanks, and overall there's around 100,000 people employed in research and the MTP sector. So we've got great infrastructure and great people behind innovation in Australia. I'd say that Australia's got a really sophisticated healthcare system. So our standards of care and the whole healthcare system is really sophisticated, which makes Australia um, an attractive destination. The quality of our healthcare and the quality of the clinical trials as well. So we've got a whole range of things that make Australia really key. Um, we've got the R&D tax incentive as well, um, which is a benefit for companies who are coming to do research in Australia as well, being able to claim that. Medical research institutes as well to support the research um, makes all of that sort of makes Australia as a really popular um, and reasons why to come to Australia for clinical trials. I think the other thing is that we've got great skills and knowledge in early running early phase clinical trials as well. So running those complex clinical trials. Um, we've we've got a lot of expertise in that area. So that's something for Australia to harness. However, although Australia has a vibrant research sector supported by world-class infrastructure and facilities, our productivity for commercialisation does continue to decline. And in 2020, when we look at the Global Innovation Index, Australia ranked 23rd in this index. In 2018, we were 20th, so we have slipped a little bit in recent years. But if you look at the sub-indexes, uh, since 2014, has, Australia has consistently ranked between 10th and 13th in the world for innovation inputs, which means that we are punching above our weight for research. But when we look at innovation outputs, we're ranked from about 22nd um, in 2014 down to 31st in 2020. So just to put this into perspective on this measure, we're ahead of Hungary, but we're behind Bulgaria. And while these measure, measures are not sector specific, they do underscore the scale of the task of lifting innovation outputs, that is commercialising products that are derived from our medical research. So we need to be ensuring that we're supporting the translation of excellent research um, that's coming out of our MRIs and universities and labs across the country. So with this slide, I'll bring you back to MTP Connect's priority outcomes that are, we're concentrating on to grow the sector in Australia. The first one, as I mentioned, is improving collaboration and commercialisation between researchers and industry, but also within industry to achieve stronger commercialisation outcomes. We're working to improve management and workforce skills. This is imperative to ensure that we've got the right skills necessary to grow the sector. We're also working to identify any policies or regulations that might be barriers to growth of the sector. And we're also working to improve the capacity for the sector to engage internationally to access markets and global supply chains. So through our growth centre funding, which I mentioned earlier, we've supported a wide range of sector initiatives. These are sector-wide and they range from supporting infrastructure programs that support research. We've got education programs that we support. There's voucher programs, and we also support networks or catalytic bodies. Some of those examples that I speak about in terms of networks and catalytic bodies, uh, we've got the Industry Genomics Networks, uh, Network Alliance that we've uh, supported the formation of. We've got a regenerative medicine catalytic body coordinated by Oz Biotech. And we've also, out of our um, AMR paper that we put out, Fighting Superbugs, we've actually taken the step 
to develop the AAMR Net, Australia's Antimicrobial Resistance Network that MP MTP Connect itself is coordinating. We've also supported the likes of And Health for digital health, as well as MDPP um, to develop uh, diagnostics. Now, you can, as you can see from this slide, that the overall output from the Growth Centre initiative has seen 294 new technologies being invented or progressed. We've had 203 new patent trademark applications or licences, uh, 166 new products, 84 new startup companies, and more than 800 new jobs being created in these project companies. And the total sector investment that has gone in into the sector through this growth fund has been $103 million. Now, earlier I also mentioned the BMTH program, the Biomedtech Horizons program. This is the $45 million program, which is intended to address the gaps in early biomedical and medical technology product development and increase the number of new viable medical technologies reaching proof of concept or beyond, which means that they're more attractive for further private capital investment and commercialisation. So through this program, eligible organisations could receive up to $1 million of funding for over a two-year project, and we've supported um, 39 projects so far over three rounds. And this slide just shows just a range of the technologies that we've supported so far. I've just chosen three um, to highlight, one out of the Bionics Institute, one out of the University of Melbourne, and the other one is with being Anatomics. Anatomics has received funding through uh, BMTH round one and three for two different technologies. Similarly, through the Biomedical Translation Bridge Program, this provides up to $1 million of matched funding to nurture the translation of new therapies, technologies or medical devices um, through to proof of concept stage. And with this particular program, they also receive industry support um, through partners. Um, we've got a mentoring program for them as well with our partner organisations of BioCurate, UniQuest and uh, Medical Device Partnering Program. The Bridge and Bridge Tech programs are also part of this um, program as well. So, so far we've supported 21 projects. Um, it's therapeutic area agnostic um, as well. But this particular slide just shows, once again, three of those projects. One example being Noisy Guts out of WA that's invented an acoustic belt that uses AI to help diagnose and monitor gut disorders. Um, the second example is out of round three of BTB, which was a COVID-specific round where we supported the University of Melbourne in the development of a patient isolation hood uh, that was aimed at pro uh, protecting healthcare workers and uh, reduces of viral load in the environment. And you've also got BARD-1, originally the technology out of University of Adelaide and Griffith University, but Melbourne-based company, um, which is developing a liquid biopsy blood test for breast cancer. So these are just some of the examples of the programs that we've been running to help these uh, projects further along their commercialisation journey. But in addition to the strategic funding and um, separate to that activity, MTP Connect does assist with research and, uh, institutes and SMEs with their pre-submission review of their translation and industry-focused product development competitive grant applications. So it's an important part of what my team does. The stakeholder engagement team at MTP Connect um, is part of these reviews. We have discussions with project teams that are looking to put in applications um, to ensure that they've got the right connections and have the best possible um, application to put forward. So, so far they've, we've seen 240 CRCPs being reviewed the Cooperative Research Centre projects. Eight CRCs have been reviewed. 34 ARC consortia have been advised or mentored. So this is the industrial transform transformation training centres and the research hubs. And all of this, all of this value-added activity has resulted in 48 grants being awarded, resulting in $190 million into the MTP sector. 
But we also need to ensure that, that we've got the right skills and we're focusing on the right things in this development and commercialization journey. And we know that there are some already, uh, we already know about some skills gaps and barriers along that journey. So this slide is just a, a few pictures to reference some of those uh, things we need to be concentrating on. The first of all, we need to begin with the end in mind. We need to be ensuring that what we're focusing on is what the regulator or payer would need. And this includes looking beyond Australia. International markets are key and we need to be understanding the requirements in other jurisdictions. We also need to be ensuring that we're building the right collaborations with industry and academia and building the right teams with the right expertise. We need to be ensuring that teams have clinician input, regulatory support, payer support, marketing input and the expertise within the team to actually commercialise as well. And we also need to be ensuring that we're keeping in mind what the customer needs and who is the customer. So when we're developing our products, we need to be ensuring that we're very clear on that. We know what the unmet need is and where we fit into market. So these are some of the known skills gaps. And we've certainly got programs such as the Bridge and Bridge Tech programs, which help with people understanding the pharmaceutical development and medical technologies development um, journey. So having the right skills is key to supporting the work um, and ensuring that we've got the right outcomes across the sector. And to this end, uh, we led a survey of workforce skills across the sector to understand where the gaps were across um, the MTP sector. And we also released the Ready Interim Skills Gap Analysis. So this was the first of three reports where we were having an in-depth look at what the skills gaps uh, across the sector were that were impeding um, commercialisation activities. And this is um, serving as a blueprint to ensure that Australia's MTP workforce is fit for purpose and appropriately positioned to capitalise on current and future global um, opportunities. So the report identifies priority skills gaps that need to be addressed over the coming 12 to 18 months. And these included things such as product development and commercialisation skills, health economics and regulatory affairs. It covered clinical trials, advanced manufacturing and supply chain, a shortage of specialist and technical skills such in areas such as genomics, pharmacology and toxicology. And a more comprehensive root and branch review will be delivered later this year. We've got another interim report that has come out this month. Um, but certainly more information will come out. Now, with each report that we put to market, we've also put out requests for proposals for organisations to put forward programs to address those skills that have been identified. So just a little bit more um, around the READY initiative, which these skills reports are all a part of, and just looking at what the opportunities are as part of the READY program, the Research Exchange and Development Within Industry program. The READY program is delivered across three pillars. The first one is expansion of proven programs, which are addressing known skills gaps. And from this slide, you can see that we're working with partners such as Ant Health, GSK Australia, IMNIS, MDPP, and the MedTech Actuator to deliver on those programs. There's information about those programs on our website and on their websites, so please take a look at those programs that are on offer. Pillar two, which I've already touched on, is the comprehensive skills gaps analysis, which will be supporting the new programs. We've got existing partners of the George Institute for Global Health and, and the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre, but we'll be having more partners come on board as we have, as we have organisations develop new programs to address the unearthed skills gaps. And then the third pillar is around industry placements, internships and fellowships. We've got our existing partners of APR Intern and the Bridge and Bridge Tech programs, but I certainly will talk to this a little bit more. Because we heard through the Ready Skills Gap Analysis, the interviews that we conducted, that quite often there's an experience gap rather than a skills gap. Quite often uh, people can have the theoret theoretical knowledge of what needs to happen for commercialisation but they haven't actually done it. They haven't worked in an environment or in a company that has actually been working on that and experienced it firsthand. There's only so many research jobs out there as well. And 
with research backgrounds, there's highly valued roles within industry as well. So there's a lot of different opportunities and I found it really engaging working with industry. I absolutely loved it. You've got people who are so passionate about what they do, whether they're people that you're working with within your office in Australia, global colleagues as well, um, as well as the staff within hospitals. Everyone's so passionate about what they do. So I think you can find your niche and your area of interest and I think people just need to be sort of um, open-eyed about that and we need to be tapping into the mentoring program so IMNIS that we support as well to be able to um, engage with PhD students to open their eyes and to um, to expand their view in terms of what the opportunities are as well so I think it needs to happen at all levels I think we need to be having these conversations at school, um, the importance of STEM and, and and getting away from those traditional roles, um, right through to PhD um, students as well, and being able to help with mentoring in that regard as well. And there's a great community of mentors out there who are involved in different programs such as IMNIS um, to help with those conversations as well. So a few of the programs that we also already support, I already mentioned the Bridge and Bridge Tech programs, which support placements for internships for their participants of three to six weeks. The APR intern provides late stage PhDs candidates to go and work in industry for up to five months. And then the third one is the Ready Fellowship Program that MTP Connect is running. That's aimed at researchers or clinicians or tech transfer professionals being able to go and spend six to 12 months working in industry for a period of time. And then for them to take that, get those skills and knowledge that they've learned from working with industry back to their home organisation. So this is a way of really ensuring that we're able to increase the knowledge and expertise of individuals, but also taking that knowledge back to their home organisation, whether it be a research institute or a clinician environment or a tech transfer office, um, to be able to further have a ripple effect with commercialisation and entrepreneurial mindset as well. So look out for information for that. That is different rounds of applications. Uh, the first round of applications for those fellowships has closed, but there's certainly more rounds of applications um, forthcoming. Now, as a part of MTP Connect's role as acting as an independent voice and ensuring that we are building access to global markets, supply chains, and making international connections, we've released a number of publications these are wide-ranging publications. Some are aimed at looking at specific issues across the sector. As you'll see, uh, we've put out publications such as Regenerative Medicine, which has also led to the formation of the Regenerative Medicine Catalytic Body. We've got the Precision Medicine Roundtable uh, white paper that was put out as well, as well as the Fighting Superbugs report, which I also mentioned from that we've got the Australian Antimicrobial Resistance Network, which has also been formed to support AMR in Australia, but also with a global view and global reach. We've also put out reports addressing or upskilling or providing information about um, access to international markets and different things that need to be considered. The report uh, down the bottom on the right, um, how to engage with global medtech and pharma corporates engaging with Australia, this is a great resource for understanding the differences between medical technologies and pharmaceuticals and engaging in different markets and how to engage with big corporate organisations. We work in a global environment, so we need to be understanding what it takes to uh, market a product in different uh, jurisdictions um, and understanding those differences and opportunities as well. The US and Europe represent huge opportunities for Australian uh, companies and companies need to know how to navigate those markets um, and have a strategy around that. We've also put out reports around frugal innovation and digital health in Indonesia. There's certainly opportunities within our region for medical device companies and digital health companies to access those markets. When you think of Indonesia, um, the amount of spend per capita on healthcare 
is very small compared to Australia at $150 versus $6,000, more than $6,000 in Australia. Um, there's a need to be altering how you uh, market products in those countries and how you go into those countries um, for your products as well. We've also got um, the report which explores opportunities in India. Um, the healthcare sector has grown substantially um, in recent years and it's tipped to keep increasing. Um, so there's great uh, opportunities for medical devices in that particular jurisdiction as well. So a number of reports we've, we've put out to help the sector navigate international markets as well. All these reports can be downloaded from our website, so I encourage you to take a look at them as well. Now, what I have not touched on is the big news in the sector around the modern manufacturing strategy. And while I haven't talked about manufacturing specifically today, medical products is one of six national priorities um, under the manu modern manufacturing strategy. So when we think of medical products, we talk, we're talking about medical devices, medical technologies, pharmaceuticals, biotech, and digital health. And with the federal government's focus on the modern manufacturing strategy, where their vision is for Australia, to be recognised as a high quality and sustainable manufacturing nation. It's important that we remember that medical products are of value and in this particular um, strategy. And this slide shows the smile curve of manufacturing from pre-production, production activities and post-production. You'll see that the high value added um, areas of the smile curve are in R&D at pre-production and then at the end, post-production activities as well. A lot of our work in our sector is around this R&D part of the smile curve. So it's important to recognise the importance of this work in the economy. It contributes to high value jobs and will be certainly very important as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic as well. In terms of investment in R&D, you've got the government investment in through different programs and some of the programs that we run on behalf of the MRFF are government funded but they certainly do attract investment from private sources as well and some of the programs that we run do require matched funding. So you've got this mix of being able to leverage government funding to then attract more private investment as well and that's key um, for growing the investment in R&D as well. And from that, th the work that we do through the BMTH and BTB programs is then working toward for them to be able to actually attract further investment um, from private capital as well or the other major programs that are out there as well. So that's a key thing of what we're trying to do is actually help with the R&D through these strategic initiatives around R&D investment but them having them in the position to attract private investment as well. So we need to be leveraging both. So to conclude, I'd just like to reiterate that we've got great potential to increase commercialisation of the innovations across Australia. We've got great people, we've, they're skilled, and we've got the infrastructure to support it. And we've certainly got the history to know that we have had great innovations coming out of Australia. For our scientific community, it's so important that we're taking these innovative ideas from the, from the bench to the bench side, to the bedside, and we look forward to seeing how Australia can contribute to commercialising more of the great innovations coming out of our research sector. Thank you.